Okay. So today we're going to talk about repeated measures ANOVA. Uh, we're going to talk about one more ANOVA after this, but um, this is where a lot of statistics classes stop at the undergraduate level. So repeated measures ANOVA. So all of the ANOVAs that we've done so far have involved repeated measurements, right? Like we get an observation of, oh, I'm trying to remember some of the dependent variables that we talked about. Uh, reaction time. We got one person's reaction time with a certain type of cube. We got another person's reaction time with a different cube, right? So we are gaining lots of measurements. We have repeated measurements. However, we're measuring the dependent variable for uh, various levels of one or more independent, independent variables, right? So we have the response time for different types of cues. We have response times for different encoding times. We have new response times for the interactions of those factors. Now, this is not what's meant by repeated measures of ANOVA. So we, we can do ANOVA if we didn't have some type of repeated measurement. So this is not what we mean when we say repeated measures. So what do we mean? Does anyone have an idea? What type of measurements are being repeated in a repeated measures ANOVA? Why do you call it repeated measures? So in repeated measures ANOVA, we call it the repeated measures because we are repeatedly measuring the same subject multiple times. So previously, we had one subject for one encoding time and one Q-type, and then we had a different subject for a different encoding time and a different Q-type, right? With the repeated measures in OPA, you're going to have one subject for one Q-type and one encoding time, and you'll have that same subject again for a different uh, Q and a different encoding time. So basically, you are going to be repeatedly measuring the same subject. And the subjects could be schools, people, or societies. So in like most of the examples that we've talked about, we've talked about effects of people, right? How does the effect of exposure to media, uh, or how, does, how does exposure to media affect one support for Hamas, right? We're talking about individual people. But we could talk about schools, we could talk about societies or other things too. So each subject is going to produce a measurement for each level of the factors or the combination. So we have one subject, and lots of measurements for that one subject, okay? We'll have another subject, and lots of measurements for that subject. Basically, for each subject that we have in the experiment, they are going to be measured for each condition. All right. <clears throat> so if we imagine an example of effective teaching style, you could have some treatment to change how instructors teach. You can measure students' scores before you make a change, and then measure their scores after you make a change, right? Now, you could do this differently. So here I say school one is measured before and after an intervention. <coughs> Notice here I'm repeating the measurements. I'm measuring school one before and after. Also, I'm measuring school two before and after. I, did you have a question? Didn't we do the same thing before? In what situation? Uh -huh. So when we did the, the pictures of the kids with the different captions, we didn't do it before and after. Right? We said that, well, we showed one group of people the Israeli caption, another group of people the Palestinian caption, and another group of people no caption, right? So we have different people in the Israeli caption, different people in the Palestinian caption, different people in the no caption, right? That's different from saying we have a whole bunch of people, we show them the Israeli caption, then show that same group of people the Palestinian caption, and measure their response again, and get the same group of people and not show them any caption and measure their response again, right? Now, if you did that, like that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense from a methods 
standpoint. Because once you see the first thing, if you see the same picture later on, it has a different caption, you might be thinking, oh, you know, what's going on? So you might not want to do that with the repeated measure design. Here, you don't have to do this with the repeated measure design. You can imagine that you measure school one without an intervention and school two with an intervention, right? But here, we're measuring both school one and two before and after some intervention. So we're getting multiple measures of whatever the dependent variable is. But this is analogous to our dependent t-test. So earlier, you asked, like, well, haven't we done this before? And I asked, well, in what situation? The reason I asked in what situation is because we did do this before when we had a pair of t-tests, right? So when we had the independent t-test, we had some factor of interest, and it only had two levels, right? We're limited to two levels when we've got a t-test. So we have some factor of interest with two levels. And the independent t-test, we had one group of subjects getting one of the levels, and another group of the subjects getting another level. So if we go back to the Israeli-Palestinian thing, if we forget about the control condition, if we just compared Israeli versus Palestinian, there we could have done an independent t-test, right? In fact, when we first talked about ANOVA, I showed you how ANOVA gave you exactly the same results in terms of p-value that the t-test did. And it turned out that f was just t-squared for that special circumstance. But just like with the t-test, where you can, you don't have to have independent samples. You can have paired samples or group samples, correlated samples, where in the t-test you are giving the same individual or, or the, a paired individual different levels of some factor of interest. So <clears throat> this, basically the repeated measures ANOVA, is sort of equivalent to the dependent t-test. Now the cool thing about the repeated measures ANOVA, unlike the dependent t-test, is the dependent t-test is limited to two levels of a single factor. With our ANOVA, we can have as many factors as we want, with as many levels as we want. So this will allow us to answer potentially more interesting questions. OK, so let's contrast this, the repeated measurements of the same subject multiple times, with what we've been doing. So for our non-repeated measures, the RM stands for repeated measures. For our non-repeated measures, ANOVA, how many measurements do we have for each subject? So we have. Israeli, Palestinian, control. He's saying one. We have one measurement for each subject. Is that right? Yes. Yes, that's right. We have one measurement per subject. That's exactly right. Each subject is in their own condition. They're not in all of the conditions. They're not in multiple conditions. They're only in one. In terms of subjects, what is the total sum of squares? Pardon? So you're saying that our sum of squares for our subjects would be the difference between each subject and the grand mean? Yes. Square those, add them up. What would that equal? Each subject minus the grand mean, square those, add them up. Error, 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 or effect, error, error, and effect. What is the sum of squares, error, and effect? That's the sum of squares total. So in terms of subjects, the total sum of squares for our subjects, it's the sum of the square differences between each subject and the grand mean. When we defined our sum of squares total earlier, we said that it was the sum of the square differences between each observation and the grand mean. But each observation is just from one subject. So we could say each observation or each subject here. It's the same thing. This is our total sums of squares. In terms of subjects, what is the error sum of squares? 
sum of squares. And then we broke it down into pieces, right? Pieces for effects, pieces for errors. Actually, just one piece for the error. Each individual score? Uh-huh. Each individual score. Subtract. Subtract. From the mean. Which mean? mean of the, the mean of the group. The mean of the group. The mean of the condition. The mean of that particular level of the factor, if you were just looking at the factor, or the the combination of the levels of the factor, if you were looking at the, um, the interactions. So basically, it's the sum of the square difference between each subject and the condition means. Right? Before we said each observation, but each observation is just the subject. So we can redefine sort of what we were thinking about um, in, in terms of subject. And this can be useful. So let's see. So for this class, I've created a data set. The data set will be posted online. So after class, you can go through it and we'll see if you can come up with the same answers I get. Anyway, the data come from a hypothetical memory experiment in which participants have to remember lists of words. This is a really common task in the memory literature. Okay, I'm going to give you a big long list of words. It could be five words, it could be a hundred words, it could be lots of words. Okay, study this list for five minutes. Okay? So we're giving our subjects a list of words, and their job at the end, they're going to get tested on it. And we're going to say, okay, here's a blank piece of paper. Write down all of the words that you can remember. Okay? So our dependent variable is going to be some score, which is just how much they remember. Right? This could be a percent, or it could be a raw number, raw number of items that they remember. But we have some score. The independent variables here, I have two of them, Q and list. So a Q, what is a Q if you're talking about memory? Color. Color? Color could be a Q if you were talking about a memory. Display size. Display size? Display size typically isn't something that's talked about with memory. You can talk about list size, like how big the list is. It's not really a display in the same sense that visual search is. So a cue, let me give you some cues for a memory. This is a female recording artist. She's huge, potentially the biggest female recording artist of all time. Does anyone know? Does anyone remember yet? She had a lot of hit songs in the 80s, like a virgin. Madonna. Madonna, Madonna right? Has everyone heard of Madonna? You all have memories of Madonna. I am giving you cues. I'm giving you information to help you get that memory out. So when I give people a test, I could potentially give them a cue as to what was on the list. Instead of just saying, okay, here's a blank piece of paper, write everything down, I could say there were five animals and there were four different types of fruit Right? I can give people cues, information, and hopefully, what should a cue do? Should it increase or decrease someone's memory? Increase. It should increase it. So a cue is basically whether or not they receive a hint to help them remember. Let me shut the door. That's so cool. You guys are probably coming up there, like here where the wind is coming in. Okay, so list. So I wasn't thinking about the size of the list, the number of items that appeared on it. I was thinking about what types of words that the list contained. So the list, in this hypothetical example, can contain abstract words or concrete words. Abstract words are things like freedom, integrity. It's like hard to define what those things are. You can't point to a picture and say, aha, that's freedom, right? Whereas concrete words are things that are really easy to define. You can find a picture and point to it. Like ferret. Do you guys know what a ferret is? A ferret is this small mammal. It's sort of like a rat, except it's furrier. Whatever. I wanted to find another low frequency word to go with freedom. Anyway, so our high frequency words could be like integrity, justice, freedom. And uh, a list with concrete words would be things like dog, chair, camera, okay? What do you think would be easier to remember? Sycamore. 
Concrete words. Yeah, typically concrete words are easier to remember than abstract words. So we have some memory scores. We have two factors that we're interested in. Does a cue help? Does getting a cue help people remember? Does the type of list matter? And we can also talk about one other thing. The interaction. The interaction between. So maybe since the common word or the concrete words are already easier to remember, maybe a cue isn't going to help you as much as a cue might with abstract words. Does that make sense? So there could be an interaction between those. Okay, so let me go back actually for a second. So we said in terms of subjects, the total sum of squares is the sum of the squared differences between each subject and the grand mean. So let's see. I'll do a one-way ANOVA, non-repeated measures, with subjects as our factor. So in this data file, subject B contains a list of subjects. One subject for each observation. So can anyone tell me what my model would be? We have some model, right? A O V equals some stuff. Uh, our dependent. Our dependent variable. Okay. So that's scores. The funny little symbol, the tilde. Scores is modeled by. Q Q and B. Well, here it's a one-way ANOVA. Q Q list for list. With subjects as a factor. It's not Q, it's not list. It's subject B. That, right? So we want to see what the effect of subject B is. Let's get the, the total sum of squares for that. Alright? Okay, so we have our model. This is it. What else do we need? Data. We tell it where we have it. I usually just say things as data. So we get something like this. Okay? Alright, so if you were to do this with my data set, oops, you get something like this. So the summary of that model, it says subject B, there are 15 degrees of freedom, and this is our sum of squares, and this is our mean of squares. There is no F, there is no P. There are no residuals. Why? It's one-way. It's a one-way ANOVA. But when we did one-way ANOVAs before, we had residuals, right? So if I did a one-way ANOVA for Q instead of subject B, I would have residuals. Because it's non-repeated. Non-repeated. But our previous ANOVAs weren't repeated. It has to do with subjects. What did I say a few slides ago? In terms of subjects, what is the total sum of squares? It's the sum of the square differences between each subject and the grand mean. Right? Yeah. When we were talking about the effect of something, if we wanted to find the effect of Q, what would we do? Well, we need to take the difference between each level of Q, the mean for each Q minus the grand mean, right? Square that, sum them up, and multiply by something. Here we didn't need to multiply by anything because each subject is our observation. We're not basically meaning over anything, or if we are, the mean is size one. So this, this is the total sum of squares. That's the total sum of squares. Right? Earlier he said, well, it's the sum of squares of the error plus the sum of squares for the effect, right? That's the total sum of squares. What sum of squares is left over? There's nothing left over. We've accounted for both the effect and the error. That's why we have no residuals. And since we don't have any residuals, 
we can't compute a mean square for the residual. And since we don't have a mean square for some error term, yeah. what can't we compute? We can't compute f. We can't compute f. We can't compute f here. That's why it's not up there. All right, so there are no residuals because that sum of squares is our sum of squares total. Each subject provides one data point. So if we are modeling our scores by our subjects, we're saying each score is the score of the subject, right? But each subject is only contributing one score, so we're actually not estimating anything. Okay, let's do a two-way ANOVA, non-repeated measure, with Q and list as factors, okay? So the model should look something like this, right? Summary, we're going to do analysis of variance, scores, is modeled by Q, asterisk list, which means we want the effect of Q, we want the effect of list, and we want the interaction between Q and list, right? So if we do this, we get something that looks much more normal, right? So we have our sum of squares for the Q, for the list, for the interaction, and we also have residuals. Now, with those pieces and our degrees of freedom, we can calculate the mean squares, and then we calculate the f values. We can get the p values as well, right? 1 minus pf with this f score with 1 and 12 degrees of freedom. You can find p. OK, so the residuals, this is our error. This is what we've been talking about as error. Right? Now earlier, let's go back. We said that the sum of the square differences between each subject and the condition means was the error. Right? That's this part that's left over. So let's see if things add up. So our sum of squares total is going to equal the sum of squares for our cube plus the sum of squares for the list plus the sum of squares for the interaction plus the sum of the squares for the error. And we get 1, 3, 3, 2, 1. That should be the sum of squares total. Right? Now we just did an ANOVA earlier where we only included subjects. Let's go back and see what the sum of squares was. What was it? 13320, here we have 13321. Why? Basically the same thing. Why? Why is it different? Because subject was going. Why don't we have 13320 here? Is it rounding? It's rounding. Yeah. So we had. A rounding error, curse the rounding. Oh. But basically, all of this, that's this, right? So he was absolutely right. When we looked at all of the subjects and calculated the sum of squares for all of the subjects, that includes the effects of, well, all of the effects that there were, plus the error, right? Oh. All right, so let's talk about the sum of squares error for the non-repeated measures ANOVA. Now our error has to do with individual differences, and we've talked about Aisha and a role and other people. And how do we get individual differences? Then we subtract. Without worrying about subtracting or anything. Where do the individual differences come from? Random things. Some people are smarter, some people are female, some people are uh, more careful, some people come from high socioeconomic backgrounds, some people have four siblings, right? All of those individual differences go into error, right? So some such as faster, smarter, blah, 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 all that jazz, right? There's also something else. So some factors affect different subjects differently. Some factors affect different subjects differently. Can anyone give me an example of this? Uh, for example, if I love colors, uh -huh. and if I find uh, the work with color, I will, I will, um, I will feel differently. And uh, maybe I will have experience. I had experience, so it affects me. 
So if she really likes colors, and she gets some color words on that list, she might pay more attention to those, right? So that could affect her differently than it could affect someone else. There are people who um, take drugs, like they go to the hospital, and the doctor prescribes them something, and they die. Why? They're allergic to that particular drug. Not all drugs affect all people the same way, right? So based on your genetics, some drug that could help you a lot could end up killing someone else, which is why they suggest you don't take someone else's prescription because your doctor hasn't prescribed that for you. That was for someone else with different differences, right? So we have error that has to do with just individual characteristics, but also how the factors that we're interested in affect people differently. So different types of lists may have different effects on different people. Different cues may have different effects for different people, right? What else could there be? Yeah. Okay, what, what else could our error contain? There's one more thing. Let me hint. So the main effects of factors might affect people differently. Main effect? Main effect? What's the main effect? What's the main effect? <laughs> Yeah, so it has to do with the, the mean of some group. So uh, a concrete list of words should be remembered better than an abstract list of words, right? So getting a concrete list pushes you above the mean, and getting an abstract list pushes you below that mean, right? So those are the effects of some fact. But we have more than just effects when we have a two-way ANOVA. What else do we have? Interactions. We have interactions. So our error also could contain differences that have to do with how the interactions affect different people, right? So maybe getting no cue for some type of a list doesn't matter for one person, but it matters a whole lot for someone else, right? So her with her colors, she has the colors. So getting the cue doesn't help her at all. But getting the cue helps you a lot because you don't care about colors, right? So the interactions also could affect different subjects differently. So we have error that could potentially be broken down into lots and lots and lots of different pieces, right? All right, so the F statistic for our non-repeated measures is just the mean of squares of the effect over the mean squares of error. We have the same error term for all of our effects and interactions when we're using the non-repeated measures, right? We have that one residual down on the bottom, and we use that one mean squared and that one degree of freedom as the denominator for all of the effects and interactions that we're looking at. Now, that error piece for our non-repeated measures contains all of those differences that we just mentioned. Differences due to subject speed, due to gender, due to motivation, due to whatever, plus the error due to how the factors affect the subjects differently, plus the error due to how the, the interactions of those factors affect subjects differently, right? So we have all of these pieces that are going into the mean squared error for our F statistic when we're doing a non-repeated measures ANOVA. Now this is an interaction, right? Basically, the effect of some factor depends on the person. That's an interaction. It's different, hmm? it's different than the normal interaction. How so? Because this is interaction between not two levels or not two factors. This is interaction between the effect and the subject. It's an interaction between the effect and the subject. OK, this is interesting. So we have some effect, right? Let's talk about Q. We have two levels. Yes, they got one. No, they didn't, right? So we have a factor Q with two levels. Now what I said is that this 
here is an interaction. And he's saying, but no, the subject, it's not really a factor with different levels. Is that what you're saying? Is subject a factor with different levels? What's, what's the factor? This is the easy question. No, no, no. We, we've talked about this factor already. I asked, is subject a factor? Some people said yes. So I'm saying, what's the factor for subject? Subject. 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 That is the factor, right? What are the levels of subject? No. Human lists are different factors. Subject A, subject B, subject C, subject D. I said earlier that we had 16, 16 subjects, I think. Did I have that up there? So if I had 16, if I have a subject 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I have one factor subject with 16 different levels. No? So, so the interaction we calculate normally, he says, is an interaction between two factors, okay? So if we can do two factors, let's say, for example, in the home of like two multiplied by four by two, so there are like two levels, four levels, two levels for each factor, those we are interested in. But the sample size is something different. Okay. There are several things he said. One is that we have several factors, like we have one factor with two levels and another factor with four levels, and we multiply those together to get the total number of conditions, right? And he said, this, this is really important, this is crucial. He said that these are the factors that we're interested in. Did you guys hear him say that? These are the factors we're interested in. He didn't say these are all of the factors. He said that these are the factors we're interested in. So which factors are we not interested in? Which has to do with subject. subject. Subject is a factor. It's a factor that most research designs don't care about. Some do, some do. There are studies on individual differences that care a lot about subjects. But for most of the research I do, most of the research most of my colleagues do, subject contains error. And we want to get rid of error. Right? That's what we did when we did the dependent t-test, right? We had one subject at one time, one subject at another time. We subtracted the second time from the first time to give us an estimate of the effect that was free of all of the error involved in the subject, right? So we do have a subject factor, and it does have different levels. As you said, we're not really interested in the effect of subjects. We're interested in the effect of view and list and their interaction. But this is still there. And we could say 16 by 2 by whatever, if we wanted to. OK, so this is just an inter interaction between subject and cube, or potentially subject and list. This is also an interaction. It's a higher order interaction. It's an interaction between subject and Q and list, right? Whew. Okay. Now, the problem with our non-repeated measures ANOVA is that we can't distinguish between the different error sources, right? When we did that ANOVA modeling our um, scores as a function of subject, it just gave us one big sum of squares, which was the sum of six squares total, which had everything in it, all of these different types of error, right? So because it has all of these different types of error that are contained in it, but we really can't estimate the different error sources. Why not? Think about how we distinguish between effects of different factors. How do we tell what the effect of Q type is. Someone just said this like five minutes ago. 
We get the mean for the mean for observations with the Q minus the grand mean. You get the mean for the um, observations without the Q. Subtract the grand mean. We're going to square both of those differences, sum them up, and multiply them appropriately, right? Basically, when we're getting effects for different factors, we have multiple observations for each condition. We have multiple observations for each type of Q. We have multiple observations for each uh, level of the media that we were using, right? And we were taking the mean of the observations for each condition to figure out what the effects were. Now, when we did that, we got rid of the independent error, right? The way we took all of our sums of squares, we were dividing things up. We were saying this effect is independent of this one, this effect is independent of that one, the interaction is independent of those two, and we have the error that's independent from everything else, right? So the problem with our non-repeated measures uh, thing is that we don't have multiple observations for each subject, right? If we have multiple observations for each subject, then we would be able to hone in on parts of that subject's error, right? Faster subjects overall are going to be performing under all of the conditions <laughs> faster than other people, right? But with the non-repeated measures, we only have one observation. We don't know if this is a fast person or a slow person or a hardworking person or a, a not call. Is that right? I'll call the opposite of hardworking. Uh, we don't know if they're male, we don't know, we don't know these things, right? But when we are taking multiple measurements, those things will come out. Okay, so the repeated, measurement, repeated measures gives us multiple observations for each participant. Which means that potentially by having repeated measures for each participant, we can get an idea about the effects of our subject factor. And we can get an idea as to the interactions between our subject factor with our factors that we are interested in, or the interaction that we're interested in. So how do you get the sum of squares for the subject if we're doing a repeated measurement? Just like any other factor, you do exactly the same thing. There is no difference. The only thing is, instead of looking at Q, you are looking at subject. You get the difference between each subject and the grand mean. Right? So the mean of each subject minus the grand mean. This will give you an idea about the effect of that particular subject. Won't that give us the error? So before we had something where each observation was a different subject, right? Now let, let's let's talk about the Palestinian versus Israeli media. So imagine that we just had like one person in each of those. You could have no idea whether there was a difference between the people or a difference between the condition, right? Because we can't separately estimate the effects of the individuals from the effect of the condition. But once we start having multiple people for each condition, now what we can do is we can say, well, you know, we know a lot of large numbers, we know how random things operate, so we might have a smart person over here, but because we randomly assign people, we should also have an equally smart person over here, right? We should have roughly the same number of males as we do females. We should have roughly the same number of history students as psychology students, right? All of those things should balance out in the meetings, right? The, the, larger sample size you get, the better your estimate of the mean is going to be, right? Because all of that random variation balances out with one another. This is why the standard error of the mean 
gets pulled closer together. So now, I heard before, we had one observation of the person. And everything, the effect of that person, plus the interaction between that person and the factor, and the interaction between that person and the interactions of the factors, they're all contained in that same thing. We have no way to get out how these different things affect people differently, right? It's basically totally confounding. So what we do by getting multiple measurements, now just like we had multiple observations for the Israeli caption, now we have multiple measurements for one person, right? So having multiple measurements for one person, now we can get a pretty good idea about how fast that person is overall, if we're talking about something like response time. Right? So all we need to do is just get the mean from each subject, subtract the um, sorry, subtract right, the grand mean, subtract the grand mean from that, and sum those up after we square. Them. Okay. So this is going to be independent from the other effects. We're doing exactly the same thing that we did before which gave us independent effects and independent error. So this will give us an independent uh, sum of squares from everything else that won't contribute to the residuals. So what will happen? Since we are basically taking the effect of subject out, the residuals are going to be smaller, right? Now, the residuals uh, contribute to the error that we use for our F-test. Right, the residual sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. If we make that residual smaller, then hopefully that denominator will be smaller. F will be bigger. This is what happened when we did our dependent T, right? We took the difference, and the standard error of the difference was much smaller than this pooled standard error of the means, right? When we had things paired appropriately, and T became bigger. So, the error we use for our F has to be smaller, so F should be bigger. We're going to lose some degrees of freedom because we're taking some degrees of freedom out when we are figuring out the effects, right? So we're going to lose some degrees of freedom, but this isn't a big deal if our subjects contribute a lot of the variance. Okay, so let's do a two-way repeated measures ANOVA accounting for the main effects of the subject. So, Here, each subject is going to contribute an observation in each condition. So before we had 16 different subjects. Now we're only going to have four different subjects, each with four measurements, right? Four times four, 16. Okay, so let's specify our model. Does anyone want to specify the model? So scores. Subject. Right. 
So since we're just going to account for the effect of subject without looking at the interactions yet, we're just going to use the plus. So scores is a function of subject plus q, asterisk list, list, and data. So that gives us this. So we have sum of squares for our subject, q, list, q times list interaction, and also the residuals. Yeah. Okay, so we added this. I want to learn about this interaction. I'm interested in this interaction, right? And earlier, when I just said scores is a function, well, I can make a symbol, of q times list, we got this, we got this, we got this, we did not get this, and we got some residuals that was much, much larger. Right, if we go back. <coughs> we had residuals of four, nine, one, nine. And I said that we could estimate the effects of the subject, and that's independent of anything else, right? So what we did is we got a three-way ANOVA accounting for the main effect of subject. I didn't say any interactions of the subject, just the main effect of subject. If I wanted the interactions and the main effects, then I would have used the asterisk. And we do want this. We're going to do this in a minute, but I wanted to walk through this step first. So basically, the residuals, let's see, 590 plus 4329, so that's 9194. Same. It's the same thing. Right? So what I did is I took the residuals that I had previously and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have the same people taking this test multiple times. So I should be able to affect their overall test taking ability on this memory test, right? Some of them are going to be higher, some of them are going to be lower, some of them might be right exactly at the mean, unlikely, but maybe, right? So we'll call that the effect of subject. And we'll be able to take that out from our residual. And boom, the residual went way, way down from almost 5,000 to almost 600, right? So you see that the F value is 121.6, and no big deal. And here, where is it? So this was 121.6 before it's 20 and 1. So by being able to account for that variance that has to do with the subject, by pulling out the effect of subject, we're able to have a lot more power because our residual is much, much smaller. Well, that's pretty cool. All right. So, let me adjust the camera. All right. So this subject is just like any other factor. It can interact with any other factor or any other interaction of factors. So earlier I said that the error contains all of the differences mentioned before, which are things like error due to subject speed, error due to gender, error due to all of those things that have to do with individual subject differences unrelated to interactions between the effects that we're interested in, right? So this is what we got rid of when we included subject in our model the way that we did before. We were able to pull that out of the error term. Now, we also have error due to how factors affect the subjects differently. This is an interaction. And also error due to how the interactions of the factors that we are interested in affect the, the factor that we're not interested in, right? Which is just the higher order interaction. So we got rid of the first part. How do we get rid of the rest of those? 
Maybe it's... Not that, no. We need to change that symbol. <laughs> if we change that symbol, we will not only get the main effect of subject, we will also get the interactions of subject with Q, with list, and with Q and list. Right? So we can specify a model that accounts for the interactions too. Yay, there it is. So, we get this. Is anything odd? Wait, residue? Where did the residuals go? And the subject didn't change. Subject didn't change. Subject is exactly what it was before, which it should be, because each of the things that we are picking out here are independent from one another. So this should not change. This should not change. This should not change. Boom, good, they didn't change. Subject Q, subject list, those two things are new. And the last one too. This last one too. And there's no residuals. There's no residuals. So if we add these up, 3, 8, so that's 0, this is now, oh man, I'm so bad with basic math. 2, uh, wait, am I at the right things? Yeah. 8, 9, 590, and that's what we had before is the residuals. So we basically took that residual, which I said contained all of this stuff, and we broke that up, right? So that first part was this. These parts are these. So we don't have any error left over. All of the error has been accounted for. Okay, this is interesting. So there is no error left over. So no this doesn't mean that there's no error. It just means that there's no error left over. So, look, there, so we don't have any Fs, right? We don't have any Fs, we don't have any Ps, so something weird is going on. What happened to the residuals? We already identified that our model has completely specified the data. Like originally, when we got the, uh, just the effect of the subjects, when we had the between subjects design or non repeated measures, it accounted for everything. We accounted for everything here. Now this doesn't mean that everything is significant. You might think that, well, there are no residuals, so that means residuals equals zero. So all we need to do is divide these numbers by zero, which will give us infinite Fs. Everything is significant. No, 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 not quite. But it does give us the information that we need to compute the X. All right, we need to be smart. So when we just said that the analysis of variance for just Q and list, where did the error come from? We said that the error came from the difference between each person's score and the condition means. Right? And this error included the effects of the subjects and the interactions between the subjects and our factors. Right? We have all of this now before. This is the effect of our subject, and these are the interactions between subject and our factors, or the interaction of our factors. All right. So now we have estimates for each of those things. We know what each of those pieces are. Now notice, this error includes this. So all this stuff basically is error. So before we had one error term, now we have a whole bunch of error terms. OK. So what do we use for our error since we have multiple? Yeah. Each effect has its own specific error. Each effect has its own specific error. Let's see. Here's the effect of Q. What would the error be for Q? Subject Q and subject list. 
Subject, subject Q. Subject Q list. And then subject Q list. Scores are estimated 
by subject, Q, list, the interaction between Q and list, yeah. and their error. Right? Because we're not multiplying here, because that gives us the error, the things that we want to use as error. And R isn't smart enough to figure out what the error pieces are. So this gives you everything, but it doesn't know what the errors are, so it doesn't do the F tests for you. <clears throat> so the error, though, is something that we're going to have to specify. It. So let's take a look at it a little bit closer. So we have this error equals subject forward slash in parentheses Q by list. OK. The forward slash here does not mean to divide. If anyone looked in the modeling tutorial, so on one of the uh, study guides, I gave a link. I also sent the link through email. If you want to get ahead, start, check out this. And it basically talked about how to specify models and all that. And this does not mean divide, it means nest. Nest. What does nest mean? What is a nest? Like a bird nest. Like a bird nest. Okay, so what is a bird nest? Interactions? Wow, that, that's really deep. You're much deeper than I am. So you have a bunch of twigs and other stuff interacting, right? Because the effect of one twig is different than the effects of a whole bunch of twigs. Man, brilliant. So you basically have all of these twigs and their interactions together, and what does the nest do? Hold it. It holds something, right? The nest holds something. But I'm going to get deep, because you've inspired me, man. Thanks. So not only does it just hold that thing, it, the nest, it, the nest interacts with that thing, right? It takes some of the heat from that thing. It helps uh, to insulate that thing. There's an interaction between the nest and the thing that is nested. So the nest is just something that contains something else. That was my not very deep approach to this. And how do you nest something? Well, you put something in a nest. Put the egg in the nest, right? So what we're doing is we are going to nest this in here. Look, see how you have this little nest here? It's a, it's a nest and it holds stuff. There's an interaction between the twigs and, and the fiber and the, all that other stuff. We're going to nest our little subjects inside that nest. Nesting subjects. So what we're doing is we're getting the interactions between subject and the specified model. So the interactions, that's subject by Q by list. Those interactions. So subject Q, sorry, so I'll just say S list and S Q list, right? So we want those interactions. We had those interactions before, but we want R to know that that's our error term. So we have these different interactions, and by saying our error is subject next within list, this will allow us to compare this initial part. So we had subject plus Q times list to compare against with these interactions. So this will compare this part to that. And we get this. Notice, we don't have anything to compare subject against here, but we do have residuals for each of our factors and their interaction. And if we look closely, we may recognize something. So what is the F for our effective Q? 
65.8. That is exactly the same thing that we got earlier. No running error. All right, earlier we also calculated the interaction between the two of us. And we had something, something that was sort of close to 7. And 7.7. 7. That's actually quite a bit off from 7.124. Why? Because rounding. This earlier piece, it didn't give us as much fine grain, right? So we were dividing. There are no decimal points over here. So when we created this interaction here, we were a bit off. So we had 46 divided by 6 instead of having 45.56, which rounds up to 46. And 6.4, which rounds down to 6, right? So this is better. It will give you more accurate F values and more accurate P values. Say so what? We want to calculate the F values. Should we do it this way? You should use the better way, which is a bit more of a pain because you have to figure out this but you will get values that are actually pretty close with reality as opposed to wildly rounded things where we're off quite a bit. <clears throat> All right. So up to this point, I really haven't talked about differences relating to between and within. And in a lot of the sources that I point to you, they talk about between and within. The error between, the error within. So let's talk briefly about between and within. So, with our non-repeated measures ANOVA, the effects of each factor of interest and their interactions is estimated using different subjects, right? We have different subjects for each observation. So, the conditions vary between subjects, right? Between subjects. With our repeated measures ANOVA, the same effects are estimated using the same subjects as opposed to different subjects, right? So the conditions are varying within the subjects. Right, so with their non-repeated measures ANOVA, each observation is coming from a different person, or school, or society, or whatever the subject is. Each observation is coming from a different subject. This means that the different groups are reflecting differences between the different subjects, right? The groups are varying between subjects. There's a group of one subjects that got the Israeli caption, a group of another subjects uh, that got the Palestinian caption. <coughs> the manipulation of media exposure varied between subjects. Whereas with repeated measures, we have the same subject in each of the conditions, meaning that these conditions are varying within the subject. So the error between versus within, with our non-repeated measures ANOVA, our error term comes from the differences between subjects and the conditions. Oh, this is nice. With our repeated measures ANOVA, our error terms also come from differences between subjects and the various conditions, right? So we had our conditions, and then we looked for the variations in that condition, and those variations within that condition come from different subjects, right? We have subject one in that condition, subject two in that condition, subject three in that condition. And the error that we used had to do with between subjects. In my opinion, Specifying the error term is the most difficult part of using R. When I first started using R, I was like, oh, what do I do? Because <laughs> I have been using SPSS. And SPSS, man, I got handed SPSS here. It, it wins for simplicity on this one. All you need to do is click. This is our between subject factor. This is our within subject factor. Clean between, within, within. It's good. It figures everything out for you. R doesn't. This makes R a bit harder. But 
it forces you to think about what your error term is. And by understanding what your error term is, you get a much better understanding about what the results of your test are, as opposed to with SPSS. So the difference between you and me, when I made the switch from SPSS to R, I didn't have anyone there to help me. I didn't have a class that taught how to use R to specify pair terms for <laughs> measures no. You guys do. So hopefully that should make it easier. <clears throat> so all you need to do is understand how the different pieces contribute to build the right model. And the model that I have given you is basically it for our repeated measures ANOVA. You'll see things like model some dependent variable as a function of some, let's just call it subjects. So S, I'm not going to say S. I'll say PS for participants. Plus independent variable one, independent <coughs> variable two. How many independent variables do we want? Three? No problem. IV three. Do we want four? Let's stop here. Okay. So we have that plus our error. So what is our error? Here. So PS build our nest. IV1 times IV2 times IV3. That's exactly right. But if you only had one independent variable, if you're doing it one way, repeated measures are no one. So I think I'm going to go back to my slide and, and get rid of that three-way. Unless it was for another repeat method, then no. If I just had one variable that I was interested in, one factor, we're done. So it's not that hard. When you have someone to show you. Oh man, but when you don't get that. All right, next class. Thanks, Panova. We'll be reviewing Friday and test on Monday.